जय राधा माधवा कुंज भी है जय राधम माधवा कुंज भी जय गोपी जन्म गोपीजन्मबा गिरीवर सौरनंदन भ्रज जन हंझनंदन भ्रज जन हंझाय जम्मू न थी रा जम्मू थीरा शाहन तीरा माधवान कुंज बिहार माधवान कुंज बिहार जय जाय गौरानी थाय घोरानी थाय घोरानी थाय जाय घोरानी थाय प्रभुपाल 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 जाय प्रभुपाल प्रभुपान की जाए हरि राम संकीर्तन की जाए श्री पंच तत्व की जाए श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो एट चैप्टर नंबर ट्वेल्व मोहिनी मर्ति बिवल्डर्स लॉर्ड शिव दिस इज वर्स नंबर सिक्स ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवा ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवा ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवा तवाचरनाबोजम श्रेय काम निरासि विस्राज्यो बायथा संगम मुनया समुपासते तवाईवाचरनाबोजम श्रेय काम निरासि विस्रजो बायथ संगम मुनया समुभासते तवाईवाचरनाबोजम श्रेय काम निरासी 
Visrajobayata Sangam Munayasa Mupasate Anyone else? The Viva. I'm sorry, Tava, your, Eva, indeed, Charna Ambojam, Lotus Feet, Shreya Kama, Persons Desiring the Ultimate Auspiciousness, The Ultimate Goal of Life, Nirasi Saha, Without material desire, visrajya, giving up, ubayata, in this life and the next, sangam, attachment, munaya, great sages, samupasate. Translation, <clears throat> pure devotees or great saintly persons who desire to achieve the highest goal in life and who are completely freed from all material desires for sense gratification engage constantly in the transcendental service of your lotus feet. Srila <clears throat> Prabhupada's purport. One in the material world when he thinks I am this body, and everything with reference to my body is mine. Atogriha shetu sutapta vitayar janasamoho yamaham mameti. This is the symptom of material life. In the materialist conception, materialistic conception of life, one thinks this is my house, this is my land, this is my family, this is my state, and so on. But those who are munaya saintly persons following in the footsteps of Narada Muni simply engage in transcendental loving service of the Lord without any personal desire for sense gratification. Ayabila sita sunyam jnana karmana navrita. Either in this life or in the next, the only concern of such saintly devotees is to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus they are also absolute because they have no other desires. Being freed from the dualities of material desires, they are called Shreya Kama. In other words, they are not concerned with Dharma, religiosity, Artha, economic development, or Kama, sense gratification. <clears throat> the only concern of such devotees is moksha, liberation. This moksha does not refer to becoming one with the Supreme like the Mayavadi philosophers. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained that real moksha means taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord clearly explains this fact while instructing Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Srimad Bhagavatam, but, I'm sorry, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya wanted to correct the word Mukti Padesh in Srimad Bhagavatam, but Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu informed him that there is no need to correct any word in Srimad Bhagavatam. He explained that Mukti Padesh refers to the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu. 
One who, who offers mukti and is therefore called mukunda. A pure devotee is not concerned with material things. He is not concerned with religiosity, economic development, or sense gratification. He is interested only in serving the lotus feet of the Lord. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirase Sasunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Vanchakalpa Turu Vishya Kripa Sindhu Pehvacha Paditanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Siva Siri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare hmm. Uh, this verse gets right to the, yeah, verse and purport gets right to the essence of devotional service. Is to become ekagrata, or a one-pointed, fixed in a, in, a, in a proper direction or in a one-pointed direction. And what is that? To take up the occupational duty of the living entity, which is his eternal occupational duty, as to render transcendental loving service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead without any personal motivations. Savai pum sam tabaparo damo yato bhakti ahoksa jayahoituki apriyata jayatma supersedati. As the Bhagavatam explains in the very beginning, that devotional service is the, is the most pleasing and the most pure when it's free from personal motivations. In other words, one is not trying to gain something material. One is simply trying to execute activities that are pleasing to the Supreme Lord with the intention of pleasing the Lord. That's the focus, and Rupa Goswami gives the, gives the uh, statement here in his uh, Bhakti Rasamatu Sindham. Uh, Devotional service free from fruit of des desires or any gain from philosophical speculation. To be done for Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. To come to that stage is, is the process of bhakti. To, um, to try to surreptitiously adopt that mood may help you to get a clear understanding on what you need to do. But to actually come to that consciousness is, a, is the form of purification. Therefore, we take seriously all of the activities in devotional service because they're meant to cut away all of these, uh, uh, what we say, <clears throat> blockages or desires that are contrary to our ultimate benefit, and that is pure devotional service. In fact, when we speak about devotional service, as is mentioned, there's only one kind that's called pure devotional service. Although you'll read in the statements, <clears throat> in the Shastras, especially in the third cantor, they describe bhakti or devotional service within the different modes, the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, the mode of ignorance, which are tinged, or they're mixed bhakti, they're more like karma mishra bhakti or jnana mishra bhakti. Bhakti that is mixed with something else, but that's just to give a little indication that bhakti is still there even in a mixed form, but it's not satisfying to the self. Only when bhakti is coming to the point of focusing on the Supreme Lord with a desire to please the Supreme Lord. And that is a mindset we can develop through our practice of Krishna consciousness. That the direction of the activities we perform is ultimately meant for that person whose activity, uh, who, has, who has created all activities, Krishna. <laughs> or Krishna's pure representative. When we direct the activities to please the spiritual master, we are directing the activities to please Krishna. There's no difference. 
And so this, this verse gets right to the point <laughs> that uh, those who, under, who understand their ultimate benefit simply work for that goal in mind. So as we mentioned, to come to that stage means to <laughs> do a little introspective and see what is those activities, desires, wrong consciousness that somehow or other filters into our day-to-day -day activities, which deviates our consciousness to something less important or something not important at all. And so that it, it takes practice to come to this stage. And of course, the essence of that practice is the process of devotional service centered around the glorification of Krishna's holy name, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. In uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, in his Bhajana Rahasya, he describes the various types of blockages in devotional service, and he categorizes them in four, four categories. Uh, philosophical misconceptions, uh, an artist or unwanted things based on getting some pious activities in previous, act, in previous lives or in this life, Impious activities also are blockages, and of course, uh, offenses are really strong blockages. So he mentions these uh, four categories of four, which comes to 16. So the devotees should understand what are these blocks and somehow or other uh, try to remove them by the mercy of the process of devotional service and by chanting the holy names. Also, some of these can be very, you see sometimes devotees struggle for a long time and they don't, be, they don't really feel like they're making any advancement. There may be a very strong block either due to a last life or even this life that keeps haunting them <coughs> and they somehow or other are not able to either see it or go beyond it. But. Um, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur gives a very encouraging statement in describing how to move forward in the process of uh, uh, removing the anarthas. And he concludes his summary of ex explanations of the anarthas by saying that Harinam Sankirtan crushes, he uses that word, crushes all the anarthas to pieces. <laughs> So there, there's where there is the fast track, but still, we still be, should be aware of and carefully avoid those things which are our blocks. It's very hard to see sometimes where we are s stuck, but we can get stuck. It could be just, just a wrong understanding of a right principle, <laughs> or it could be some some offense that we haven't somehow or other dealt with when we keep making it. There are many things that come up in a more subtle way. That's why sadhu sangha, sadhu sangha, sarva sastri hoi, lava matta sarva sangha, sarva city hoi, association with devotees, helps to reveal, this is important to understand, some of these blockages that we have, simply by because the association of devotees acts like a mirror to reflect our own consciousness. <laughs> That's why it's so important to associate with devotees. Sometimes if devotees think that they can make better advancement outside the association of devotees. And you'll find that there are some devotees who, who always like to associate with devotees all the time. And then there's those who choose to associate at different times. And there's those who maybe do it a little bit less. That may be a, a particular according to one's nature. But one should adopt the mood of the sadhu sangha in everything we do, especially in the execution of devotional service, because we get knowledge from that sangha. We also get, uh, as we mentioned, a little bit of an awareness of where we need to work on it. We can start seeing our own anarthas. When we're alone, we don't see our own anarthas. We're just, we look in the mirror and we think, hmm. I'm getting, I'm making advancement. <laughs> Just see, my tea lock's even better than it was yesterday. <laughs> so you know, this kind of, uh, you know, what we say, analysis really is paralysis. It doesn't really go anywhere. So therefore, sadhu sangha is very important. I remember I was 
in a very challenging situation one time. In Chicago, we were with Bhakti Tirtha Swami. And he likes to really get to the essence and churn it and make, and make it pinching sometimes. So we were, he, we, he gave the Bhagavatam class and it was more like um, trying to understand where you need to work on or what you need to work on. So at one point, he, brought, he had the devotees break up in groups of twos and what you had to do, and this was the, the exercise, you had to say to your partner, what's my problem? <laughs> what is it about me that I need to work on? And so, in other words, he has to tell you what's wrong with you. That's the hard thing. <laughs> it's not so hard to ask anybody what's wrong with you, but when you have to tell somebody what's wrong with them, it's a little bit, a little mortifying, a little bit. And you start thinking, am I going to commit offenses in this or what? And so, yeah, well, we did it, and I think some devotees really didn't do it. They, did it. <laughs> they acted like they did it, and they, they did something else and made it look like they were. I was one of them. <laughs> so I can speak from experience. So it was really, but I think some devotees really, because after we did a, a little open session to see what, or some of the things that we learned from the encounter, and some devotees were thinking, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you, I, I, now I know what I have to work on. So devotees, some devotees were happy with that. <laughs> but yeah, so, but in the, in, in Sadhu Sangha, we have this uh, natural way of really evaluating, because we should always be in the mood of service. And this is what makes, association and Krishna conscious nice. If we're always in the mood of trying to serve in whatever app, uh, arena we are in, whether we're with one or two devotees or in the, in the Sangha with larger, then we're always in the right consciousness and we'll always have opportunities for making advancement. The enjoying mentality, or the, of course Krishna consciousness enjoy, and so when we go to a kirtan we're thinking, wow, this is going to be nice, right? <laughs> so we have this uh, propensity or tendency to uh, look for enjoyment in the activities of devotional service, which are susukam, They're, they are very pleasant and enjoyable. But the mood is the opposite, the mood is to serve, and enjoyment comes by way of service. So if if that if we can cultivate that mood more in everything we do, we find that devotional service is nice, because it puts us back in a, to our in our constitutional position. Jivaya surubai Krishna and Nityadas, that the living entity in whatever capacity is, with both either material or spiritual, cannot avoid the, the tendency to serve. Sometimes service is done in a selfish way in order to get something from that, but that's material. But in spiritual life, it's done in order to somehow or other either please Krishna or take the opportunity to uh, get purified in that atmosphere. So that will help to uh, purify, and then coming to more and more to the stage where there is no more material desires. Prabhupada makes a point, he says there's two kinds of pure devotees. Those who are fully purified from all material desires and those who are, have made the declaration that they will not act in any materialistic way. In other words, they still, the second group, they still may have some material desires, but they don't act on it. And therefore, those desires gradually dissipate through the process of bhakti and through the same time not feeding that material desire. Because when you feed something, it gets stronger like that. So being aware of that, that's part of it. And at the same time, thinking, how can I serve in each and every situation? And that... I mean, that service is done in different ways. Sometimes we accept service in order to give service. And that's another form of service. 
accepting service is, is just as important as giving service. Jai si panchatattva ki jai. So it's not that <clears throat> we don't accept service. We do accept service because that gives the chance to someone else to offer service. But at the same time, we use whatever we get from whatever people give to us as an opportunity to, to increase our own devotional service like that. So service, accepting and giving service are just two sides of the same coin pretty much. Okay, and here, and this is also, Prabhupada uses the word mukti in a little bit <clears throat> less direct way, or we might say in a broader way. He says mukti actually, in this case, or moksha, <clears throat> refers to um, devotional service. And he qualifies that in some of his statements where he says that one who is engaged in devotional service is already liberated. One doesn't have to try for liberation separately because devotional service includes liberation. In fact, it includes everything beneficial to the living entity. And of course, freedom from material uh, desires and the sufferings that come by material activities are all included in bhakti. One doesn't have to do that separately. So become, what is it, Ekavrata? Uh, what is that verse from the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, 7.28? Those who have acted piously in this life and in previous life, whose students are all eradicated, and who are engaged in free from the dualities of delusion, I engage in my devotional service with determination. Hmm. So becoming free from the results of pious and impious activities, then one is more or less without the encumbrance of the mind always being diverted towards these activities. And then one can drita vrata, means uh, fixed, or not just fixed, but fully fixed in devotional service. So we want to come to that stage. One of the ways, when in a more mechanical sense, that you can help develop that is by making a schedule in your devotional service, by trying to keep yourself aligned with a particular day-to-day -day routine. Of course, there's always variables, but <clears throat> that will help to keep the mind in the right direction, like that. If we're not, if we're not aware of what we're going to be doing later, Maya has plans. <laughs> She'll tell you what you're going to be doing later. <laughs> she has her way of, as it's mentioned, Maya knows your weakness. Whatever weakness you have, she knows that. And whatever, if you, just like in, in the, use the example in, the, in a boxing ring when two boxers are fighting, if some boxer hits one, the other one, and there's some cut or some bleeding, that's, that's a vulnerable spot now. So that, <clears throat> that fighter will try to hit that same spot again that because it becomes vulnerable. So Maya is like that. She knows, and she's fully aware where your weakness is. And she always keeps pushing in that area. Why? Not that she wants you to fall down, she wants you to learn that this is where you need to work on. And she's actually a friend like that. <clears throat> but sometimes we don't get it. <laughs> and somebody else tells us, hey, get it together. <laughs> Okay, and so this is this this verse in of N the purport is very much and Prabhupada sums up the whole thing. Um, the sweetness that comes by devotional service is so so nectarian that 
that the devotee who has reached this stage of purification cannot think of anything else but serving the lotus feet of the Lord. The lotus feet of the Lord is symbolic, but it's also uh, an absolute principle of pure devotional service. The Lord's lotus feet represents pure devotional service. As we approach the Lord in that way, in a humble way, uh, approaching the Lord at his, at his lotus feet. Or we approach actually through his representative. All right, so I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions. Maharaj, would you like to add something? Or anything? No. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this class and the importance of pure devotional service. I have a question regarding how to balance our own personal needs when requested for service. How do we know when to say no? <laughs> well, when you have a schedule, that helps you to evaluate, that's one way. It helps you evaluate, doesn't give you the absolute answer. Uh, because if you have a certain duties at a certain time of the day, you try to stick to your schedule unless there is a need. So it's not about saying no, it's being reasonable when, when the requests come for additional service. And you have to just, because if we don't clarify our <clears throat> situation, then uh, we have a certain expectation, and then those who are trying to give us service also have expectations. So therefore, when they say clarify your expectations, through communications. Yeah. So when things come up just randomly, then you have to think, well, can I do it? If I can do it, let me do it. But if I can't, then let me explain. And if there's an emergency sometimes, just like <clears throat> we found sometimes, we find there's a cook needed or there's a pajari needed and the offerings and the artis have to go on. And so the, the temple president, the temple commanders are looking for someone to fill in so someone should, you know, if you're asked, you know, it's an important service, you might think, well, this service needs to be done and I'm being asked. So I might also push aside something else to do that. So there are emergencies where deity worship needs some, you know, fulfillment at the time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? <clears throat> Anyone on the line today? No. Okay. <laughs> They're lining up. <laughs> yeah, there's one one question, Maharaj, from Avadutarai. Srila Prabhupada emphasized the importance of Varna Ashrama, but Bhaktivinoda Thakur says within Varna Ashrama one develops the material designations of I and mine, and this notion gives rise to imaginary friends and enemies. So the question, is this not controversial, because one is dear to the Lord when free from Ahamameti as per Bhaktivinoda? Well, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was asked, was talking to Ramananda Roy, he asked him to explain what is the process of devotional service. And the first time, he, first thing he said is Vanashram Acharyata. He quoted a verse about the duty of Vanashram. And Lord Chaitanya said, Io Bhaje. That's external. So it's external, but it has a place. It has a place in order to situate one in the process of activities <clears throat> which will balance one's material needs with one's spiritual activities. But then as one makes progression in devotional service, then 
then you go to what is called Daivi Vanashram. And our designation is no longer according to a particular varna, but it's, it's transcendental. We may be doing services as a Brahmin, someone may be doing services as a Kshatriya, but the identification is not based on that. <clears throat> I don't think I'm a Kshatriya. <clears throat> I think I'm a devotee who is doing duties for management or organization like that. <clears throat> but initially, for those who are new to devotional service in order to get a foothold, <clears throat> sometimes we allow that, that principle for, for engaging people in service and at the same time allowing them to take care of their material responsibilities. <clears throat> but it is external, as Lord Chaitanya showed. <clears throat> That's it. Okay. Yes, um, Urugai. Thanks, Maharaj. Uh, now, uh, uh, it's, it's relating to the question of the devotee who was asking just now uh, about Varnashrama, uh, even though it wasn't the subject of the lecture. Uh, but it was, in a way, in, uh, because I, I thought when he was speaking about Varnashrama being material, uh, because it, uh, uh, it uh, maybe strengthens the, uh, in some way the material identification and therefore, uh, uh, therefore uh, not the mentality of not being able to be equipoised towards uh, enemy and the friend, which is our well, ultimate we sh goal. We shouldn't. We we're, we're learning at the same time, you know, <clears throat> I'm not this body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of Bhagavad Gita, the first chapter, is all about the difference between you and, and your body, or what is material and what is spiritual. So if we don't take those lessons and apply them, then, you know, we'll get on the bodily conception of life. That's the, we should understand this knowledge. No, no I just wanted to say how, how very much theoretical this is for me. Because the other day, one in the morning, I did something. I mean, I didn't do something. And one on the phone, one devotee expressed a slight criticism. And I dealt with, with that, what he said uh, through the whole morning. I mean, not directly, but it was somehow in the mind, back and forth, and what he said, and, and then it, it produced the, the, the whole day of, of, of something, some <laughs> analyzing. I, I was so touched, so, so, and, and, and had some negative feelings towards... Uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's so far from my reality, <laughs> this being equipoise. So I, uh, before I, I understood that he is a friend, I need it the whole day, maybe sometime, <laughs> lifetime is needed. Are you, so. are you okay now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Problems, I'm okay, problem but... solved. <laughs> 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 These things happen. Sometimes people inadvertently say something that, that causes us disturbance, and sometimes they intentionally do it, and that's just <laughs> the way the world is. <laughs> Oh, uh, you just have to see. I don't know. I can't really sp speak for the situation because I don't know. But, you know, if you need to work it out, work it out. But if you, if you can somehow let it go and continue on... Then no, no, I just wanted to say we, we obviously aren't equipoised and Varnashrama is not going to, to, to destroy our, our equipoised poised, whatever, quali uh, uh, quality of being equipoised. Varnashrama is not the great danger for being equipoised, as this devotee was pointing out somehow. It was funny that we are speaking about such an elevated, you know... Uh, Pure devotional service here. And uh, Varnashrama is obviously needed in, in, uh, for us. Uh, here yeah. we should do something for Krishna. Ah, it's Taibi Varnashram. It's not yeah. material Varnashram. Material Varnashram has no place because nobody can sort it out anyway. <laughs> and Kalo Sudra Sambhavan, everyone's born engaged, everyone's born Sudra. 
And therefore, training and education is needed, both on-the-job service and education. If we don't read the books and understand, at least philosophically, we're not this body. <laughs> we can't prog progress. That's why Krishna made that the foundation for all the knowledge he gave later in Bhagavad Gita. The first principle he, he taught was, you're not the body, you're different. And he, made, he gave a lot of emphasis describing that, these principles from different angles, just to make it clear. Otherwise, if that concept is not understood, at least theoretically, and applied even, at least theoretically, one is simply, you know, looking for material gain in everything they do. Because it's about me, it's about the body, it's about the mind. Okay, so thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai.